Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. Of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on this occasion, as well as those joining us on the C-SPAN network. Uh, for those in-house, we would ask that courtesy to see that our mobile devices of whatever sort have been silenced or turned off, uh, simply to avoid any unnecessary distractions. For those watching online, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. We will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference following the presentations today. Leading our discussion and welcoming our special guests is Frederico Bartels. Fred is our policy analyst for defense budgeting in the Center for National Defense here at the Heritage Foundation. Please join in welcoming him. Fred. Thanks, John. And thanks, everyone, for making the time to come over here in this first day of Congress being back in town, which I assume is a busy time for everyone. Um, first, I'm just going to introduce our guests and then explain to everyone a little bit. If you're here by accident and you don't know what BRAC is, I'm just going to give you like a, a, a two-minute introduction in it to make sure that the audience knows as well, and we're all talking and talking from about the same thing. So to my left is Lucian Niemeyer. He's the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment at DOD. Lucian served as a professional staff member on the Armed Services Committee. And while at SESC, he provided oversight for the 2005 BRAC round. He is a retired Air Force officer with active duty and uh, Air National Guard services. Uh, to his left is Anthony Principi. He was the chairman of the 2005 BRAC commission. And from 2001 to 2005, he was the secretary of VA. Uh, Tony has multiple stints in the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. And to his left is Andrew Hunter. Uh, Hunter is a senior fellow at the International Security Program and director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at CSIS. Uh, he served as senior executive at DOD and a ch as chief of staff to both uh, Ash Carter and Frank Kendall while they were working at ATNL. He also served as a professional staff member at the House Armed Services Committee before all of that in CSIS. So uh, BRAC was created as a political compromise between the executive and the legislative branches to close and realign domestic military bases. The power to close military bases is understood as part of the powers of the commander-in-chief. So initially, the executive was able to determine alone which bases would be closed. This caused a legislative pushback as it affected their districts. And in 1977, Congress was able to stop all closures through highly visible reporting requirements. This reporting requirement served as a practical prohibition on base closures. They were only overcome with the creation of BRAC. A BRAC round involves establishing objective criteria for the evaluation of possible closures. DOD develops a list of recommended actions which are later assessed by an independent nine-person commission before going to the President and Congress for approval. The first round of BRAC took place in 1988, followed by three consecutive rounds in 91, 93, and 95. The fifth and last round took place in 2005. Now, 12 years later, authorizing a new round of BRAC is part of the political discussion. The need is based on estimates that we currently have over 20% of excess infrastructure and the resources dedicated to the upkeep of these bases could be better allocated somewhere else in the defense budget. And to talk about why we need a BRAC now, uh, Secretary Nehemiah is going to be able to inform us on that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Fred. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk here at Heritage uh, on this important topic, and one that's actually um, pretty timely. Uh, for those of us who watch the ongoings of Congress from day to day, uh, no, we know that uh, the Senate is about to uh, consider the FY19 Defense Authorization Act on the Senate floor, and, and we do have an amendment pending um, from both the chairman and the ranking member that would uh, provide for an authorization of a round of base realignment closure. So it's really important to be able to talk uh, to you all to take questions uh, and to be able to talk about why we believe the department is a, in a good place right now in a good position to request a requ an, an authorization for base realignment closure and to carry it out uh, with the intent of Congress and what they're looking for, both in cost savings and the ability to make the, the military more effective. 
A couple of quick hits uh, from my background on BRAC. Again, I worked it uh, when I was in, in the Air Force and then on the committee, and then ultimately now serving in a new capacity. I've been in the job for three weeks. Uh, two of those weeks I've been traveling. Just got back from a um, six days in Guam, Tinian, and Saipan. So if I start to nod off here while I'm up on stage, it's because I'm still on uh, Guam time. So yeah. you can just go ahead and poke me. That'd be great. <laughs> um, if you really look at it, for, uh, the BRAC has, has been a great process for the Department of Defense to really take a look at itself, to stand, to stand back and say, okay, where do we need to go with military value? Uh, where do we need to look at what is happening in the, in the world of weapon systems, emerging technologies, and how can we best station our forces domestically in order to take advantage of those, uh, of, of those opportunities provided by installations infrastructure, as well as to maximize the effectiveness of our weapon systems and training? If you look back on it, Congress has also shared this position, uh, this position and provided an author authorization for five previous rounds. So for those of us or for those of folks who I hear say there's no way that Congress is going to authorize a BRAC, you know, my response is they've done it um, plenty of times before. So I think ultimately Congress does believe in the value of being able to do an, a, 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 a conduct a process which is fair and transparent. If we look at also what um, the authorization provides. And again, we need to step back a little bit. People think sometimes that your, your commission is still in, in, in law mm -hmm. or that, that, that the, it is a standing authority. What, the only standing authority that the commander in chief has right now is to close military installations. Uh, standing in a way of that is Section 2867, which provides a somewhat onerous reporting requirement that has made it very tough for the secretary to actually get recommendations up to the Hill and have them considered. That's really what has resulted in um, a separate piece of legislation known as the Base Land and Closure Act that allows for a transparent open process for the Secretary to submit recommendations, uh, develop them and submit them to the Commission, which will then take a look at them and then forward on to the President. Um, the value of that particular piece of legislation to communities is immeasurable. Uh, not that any community actually wants to suffer from a background or, have, or, or suffer from a closure, but if you look at the actual law, there's only about 20 pages that talk about how the secretary will conduct the review and how the commission will consider that, that, those recommendations. The rest of the BRAC law is, is actually a series of actions that allows communities to quickly redevelop the property. About 100 pages of abbreviated NEPA of, of authorities for the establishment of, of local redevelopment authorities, um, agencies, and, and also uh, an a, a opportunity for funding from the Department of Defense to assist in the transition. So if you look at it, standing back from what the department is trying to do, BRAC really does provide uh, not just a fair and transparent process, but also a great deal of, of ability for the Department of Defense to assist those communities that are impacted by BRAC. So I think if you look at it from an objective standpoint, a community that is faced with a reduction of forces um, or a community that's faced with the potential of, of being closed, of their installation being closed, they much would prefer, they prefer to do it under the BRAC process than uh, under a uh, standard uh, process where you would declare the property access and subject it to the Federal Property Disposal Act. If you, you, you go no further than to ask the folks in the, in the communities surrounding uh, Naval Air Station Sugar Grove in West Virginia, as they're still struggling to figure out what to do with that parcel. That, that base was closed by the Navy a couple of years ago um, and, uh, under authority other than BRAC, and they're still struggling how best to reuse that property. So with that said, the department has asked for a request, uh, an authorization to conduct a BRAC um, for the last five years. Um, in the past, the request was based on the justification that there might be an efficiency to be gained, there might be savings to be, to be obtained. Um, the BRAC offered us an opportunity to see where we might have excess capacity to go ahead and close or reduce spaces in order to uh, eliminate the excess capacity, thereby saving dollars. No doubt that's a noble cause, and I, even in, in our administration, in the current re request, that is one of, the, one of the goals. But I have to say right now that the, the more important thing for us right now is the Department of Defense is the, the fact that we're undergoing a, a process within a department for, these, for the review and update of the national defense strategy. We're also looking at a whole new realm, an era of new technologies, new methods of warfare, 
emerging capabilities and fit, with fit, fifth generation weapon systems. And that really, for, for us, needs an updated basing strategy to meet an emerging and new national defense strategy. From the Department of Defense perspective, that is the sole and the primary reason why Congress allowing us the ability to look at our basing to make prudent decisions on where to station forces in order to optimize their effectiveness. You go back to Secretary Mattis' three priorities when he, when, he, when he took over as Secretary of Defense. He wants to address readiness concerns immediately. He wants to increase military capabilities, and he wants to enhance lethality. From my perspective, working for him, the BRAC process offers us the opportunity to address readiness by providing our forces the best possible ranges and installations for them to be stationed at allows us to consider where we might want to add capabilities to the Department of Defense, particularly domestically, and add force structure. Most of all, it allows us quickly and effectively to enhance the lethality of our forces by coming up with ideal stationing uh, opportunities for combined arms in order to make ourselves more effective on, and more lethal on the battlefield. So I'll go ahead and stop there, but I just want to make it clear that for us, it's not just a matter of finding efficiencies. It's a matter of improving the military value and the effectiveness and lethality of our military forces. That's why we continue to push hard and we're, we support the Senate's attempt to try to get a BRAC authorization inserted in the Defense uh, 2019 Defense Authorization Act. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, uh, th thank you, Fred. The Heritage Foundation for having us here today to talk about a very, very important topic. And I'm certainly pleased to join with my uh, colleagues, my former colleagues, Lucian and, and Andrew, in, in discussing uh, BRAC. Uh, I recall in 1993, after I was leaving the, the first Bush administration, Bush 41, I received a call from Senator Strom Thurmond, who was ranking on Judiciary Committee. And I was ready to go back to California and practice law. And he says, I need you to be my staff director on armed services because we're going to save Charleston from the BRAC. Charleston Naval Shipyard was on the closure list, and, and I accepted his invitation to uh, go back to Armed Services Committee. And I should have learned my lesson that if someone asks you to chair a BRAC, you just say no and you move on. <laughs> uh, but I didn't and had that opportunity in 2005. And I just want to build on, on what Lucian said. Um, you know, it's been, if a BRAC is authorized in 19 to take place in 2021. That'll be 16 years since since the last BRAC round. And think about the force structure changes that have taken place, reductions in, in strength in the Army, uh, combat air wings, uh, brigades, um, uh, changes in technology, emergency technology, and, and how that imp Im impacts our, our defense um, establishment, changing threat environment, yet we still have that same footprint. Uh, at the same time, there's really a BRAC ongoing, but it's a BRAC under the radar screen, a kind of a stealth BRAC. Uh, of course, DOD is limited on what they can do in terms of a closing, infra, a closing military bases. But they're forced because of budgetary constraints to move people. So brigades are consolidated and other changes are taking place. And so you have a lot of bases with empty buildings that you need to heat, you need to cool. Dollars that can be better expended uh, uh, advancing our, our, our defense establishment on our national security concerns. So one could make the argument that, indeed, uh, we need to have a BRAC. And, of course, the men and women we charge with leading our defense establishment have been pleading for a BRAC for over several, several administrations, including, as, just, as, as Lucian indicated, uh, the current administration has done so as well. Uh, 2005 was unlike any, any other BRAC in, in my view. Uh, limited experience on the 1993 BRAC. Uh, in terms of major and minor closures and realignments, it was uh, double the number of all previous BRAC rounds combined. Um, 190 recommendations that really had 783 distinct closure or realignment actions associated with it because the way uh, the, the BRAC recommendations were structured. And, and Secretary Rumsfeld made it very, very clear that this was not about cost savings, primarily about cost savings. This was about military transformation. And uh, I'm not sure we carried the ball over the goal line, but we certainly moved it down the field somewhat. And unlike on other previous backgrounds, uh, we were asked to evaluate recommendations at a time of ongoing conflicts in Southwest Asia. Uh, a stable or increasing force structure where in the past 
its force structure was declining back in 2005. In 2005, it was increasing. And the pre projected de redeployment of 70,000 70, troops and their families from Asia and Europe. So that's, that's the context upon which 2005 BRAC took place. A number of things went well. Um, you know, I was blessed to have a commission, a three, three retired four-star flag officers, Army, Navy, and Air Force, uh, two former cabinet officials, uh, two former members of Congress, both Republican and Democrat, a former Assistant Secretary of Defense, who also served as a secretary, Assistant Secretary of Energy and at the White House Office of Technology, a really an expert in nuclear, nuclear power matters, and a, a former retired two-star major general who, um, who was the head of the Arm, uh, Air Force Nurse Corps. So indeed, uh, the commission had some people of, uh, of experience, and especially the flag officers of insight into the military, whose advice was invaluable to, to all of us on the commission. We also had an incredible professional staff who had served on previous backgrounds. Uh, detailees from GAO and the Pentagon who came over to work on the staff, uh, working 24-7 for a period of time. And, uh, and of course, I think, as Lucian also mentioned, it was an open, transparent process. You never take politics out of it. You never take lobbying completely out of it. Uh, but we tried as best we could to make it open, transparent, and apolitical. Uh, 183 site visits to military installations around the country, 40 hearings uh, around the country and in Washington, and having to re produce a report uh, to sum be submitted to Congress. A number of things went wrong. Um, when, when we were nominated uh, for confirmation by, by President Bush, one senator wanted to kill Brack, so he put a hold, a hold on all of our nominations, so we had to wait to get recess appointments. The day we received, or the day after we received this volume of information from DOD, the recommendations and all the data, they determined, oh my gosh, this is classified. When you consolidate all this information, uh, it becomes classified. So we had to wait until it was declassified. And uh, that took time. And of course, we only had four months upon which to act on all of these recommendations. Um, cost issues, I mean, uh, you know, the quantitative analysis that is done to determine cost and savings is based on what's the Ackerman, Ackerman uh, COBRA model, cost of base realignment actions. Um, the GAO found that it was a reason, reasonable calculator uh, to determine what the cost and savings were as you compare these various military bases for closure. Um, but the problem was they underestimated the requirements. For example, they estimated uh, implementation costs for new construction to be about $13.4 billion. It turned out to be $25.5 billion. They underestimated the informa information technology requirements that cost significant amounts of money to implement BRAC. And very importantly, they underestimated or overestimated the personnel cost uh, savings by saying that if you close a military base and you move 5,000 people, well, you, ha you have 5,000 troops cost savings, but there was no reduction in force structure or end strength. Those people were just being moved. So the savings that they projected at $45 billion over, I think it was 10 or 20 years, I don't recall, really was significantly less. So, so those are some of the things that went wrong that I'm hopeful when the next BRAC round comes, those issues are identified and addressed. Can I borrow your pen to write sure. some of that down? That's sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll conclude there, and I think we're very blessed to have Lucian over as, as the Assistant Secretary for Installations, Energy, and the Environment, and having knowing um, uh, basically living BRAC as a member of the Armed Services Committee, as staff on the Armed Services Committee. So with that, I'll conclude and be happy to answer any questions you might have. Andrew? All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the environment for BRAC uh, on the Hill, both big picture and in, in the current situation. Um, I'm going to start uh, big picture and, and sort of what is the logic of BRAC? Why, why did BRAC ever work uh, and why might it work again? Um, I want to start actually with uh, what I think is the key point, which is BRAC always is hard and, uh, and it's not popular. It's not something Congress likes to do. And so the key element uh, is that there has to be a champion. There has to be someone in Congress who is highly respected, who is really taking this on and pushing it forward. Uh, and of necessity, that uh, needs to be someone who's, who chairs uh, one of the two armed services committee because that's the position you need to be in to really serve as a champion. 
Um, and in the past, uh, various folks have served that role. The last 2005 round, it was really Senator Warner who, who served that role. And what is uh, interesting and notable and I think very significant this year is that we have a, a champion who has stepped forward and, and Senator McCain, along with his colleague Senator Reid, the two of them together, uh, to serve as a champion. So that is a really critical, and I would say the critical uh, event. And I should recognize, obviously, Congressman Smith has been there uh, for some time uh, as a ranking member uh, and has been pushing the issue, and which has been incredibly helpful and kept it, moved the process forward. Uh, but as a ranking member, he hasn't been in a position to really push it through. Uh, and that uh, that's a key element that's, that's fallen into place this year. Uh, the basic formula that the previous BRAC rounds have operated on uh, is that uh, they start at the level of theory. And so the authority is granted when there are no specific winners and losers. Uh, the authority has been granted uh, when, in theory, everyone could be either a winner or a loser. Now, in reality, a lot of members of Congress uh, either know or believe that they have a target on their back when it comes to BRAC, and they think their facility is at risk. Uh, and by the way, there are winners in BRAC. Uh, although we tend to think of it as a as a as a losing game, uh, I happen to work for one member of Congress during my stint on the Hill, uh, Norm Dix, uh, who gained out of every background, uh, gained substantially out of every background. Uh, and interestingly enough, to to Lucian's point and and to uh, Secretary Principi's point about uh, uh, stealth BRAC, uh, the one facility that didn't benefit from BRAC. Uh, and lost a lot of, of work, which was the shipyard in his district, uh, just because the Navy got smaller. So, of course, the shipyard got smaller. Uh, they never benefited from BRAC, right, because that was not, there was no BRAC action that led to the Navy getting smaller. It was just a decline in the number of ships. Uh, they lost half their personnel and never received any economic uh, assistance as a result of a 50 percent decrease uh, in their scope because that wasn't under BRAC. But under BRAC, uh, his district was always a big gainer uh, in terms of Fort Lewis, McCord Air Force Base, uh, and other facilities in Washington State. So there are winners in BRAC, and in many cases, the folks who are likely uh, to win know who they are. Uh, but one of the key formulas has been that the BRAC authority is granted before the winners and losers have been definitively identified. Uh, then, you know, when the recommendations come back from the commission, it's an up or down vote, and the vote is to disapprove. You know, you're trying to stop something that's in process rather than affirmatively voting to close someone else's base. Uh, you're, you're just voting to keep the process going. And generally speaking, the political, uh, uh, the winners in the process have been able to just say, you know, the process worked its will. It's not that we're greedy and we're trying to disadvantage our colleagues, but this is the process. Uh, and all we're doing at that point is supporting what's already underway. Uh, I'll circle back to that point when we get to, to where we are with uh, in today's, uh, the current situation in Congress. Uh, you know, Congress has, in recent years, obviously, really struggled to uh, cope with BRAC, the idea of a new BRAC round. Uh, a number of objections have been raised. Obviously, the upfront cost uh, during a time when the Department of Defense was hit with a very sudden spending reduction in 2013 as a result of sequestration of the Budget Control Act. Uh, Obviously, there was a strong logic for uh, saving money, uh, but one of the big concerns Congress had is right now, the, or the first few years of sequestration are when the budget was the lowest and there was the biggest cut, uh, and that's when there actually would have been increased costs as a result of doing a BRAC round uh, if they had done it at that time when the department started requesting it uh, at that point. Uh, and so the idea that funding is the shortest now, but you need us to give you money today to start closing bases, which we don't really want you to do anyway, uh, that, was, that was not a political winner uh, at that time. So upfront cost has, has always been a concern. Uh, obviously, the concern of economic impacts in the communities and job loss has been a huge concern for, for members of Congress. As I mentioned, though, that's tempered by the fact that there's only a relatively small number of folks whose bases actually get closed. This is a small number of losers for whom that concern is really acute. Uh, there has been traditionally a concern, in fact, BRAC originated out of a concern about politicization uh, in brace closures. That remains a concern. Uh, every BRAC round, folks have found a way to uh, detect a hint of politicization, uh, whether it's really there or not, uh, in the process. It's, uh, and it's one reason why this issue of military value uh, has always been so profound uh, that the recommendations need to be based on military value. Uh, and that gets a little complicated, as, as uh, Secretary Principi indicated, when you have to crunch the numbers to determine, well, who, you know, 
can we turn this military value thing into a number um, that we can then compare to uh, to costs? Uh, it's a tricky thing to do. Uh, and then the, the the other issue that's been very uh, concerning to a lot of members of Congress is the idea of uh, capacity loss. You know, once you the theory going that once you give up land, you'll never get it back. Uh, now again. I don't, Lucian didn't make this point directly, but you know the history of the department says that in fact, the department has acquired land from time to time over its over its course. There's nothing that says uh, as a first principle that once you give something up, you'll never get land get it back. But that's generally the theory that Congress has operated on, and so uh, even where there's been a fairly obvious mismatch between force structure and base structure, Congress has always still said, well, but you know. That's only today. You know, what about 10 years from today? What about 20 years from today? Uh, doing a BRAC is an irrevocable decision that we can't come back from if we determine later that our needs have changed and we've got to, and got to move forward. Uh, and as, as uh, Lucian very clearly explained, that argument actually works both ways because you, you can develop this mismatch between what we need today and what we have in terms of infrastructure. And I agree with him that we are there. So let me talk a little bit about uh, about where things stand on the Hill. And as I mentioned, the, the key fact, the most uh, uh, overriding fact, is that we now have uh, a champion, in fact, now three champions, three out of four, uh, with the senior leaders in the Armed Services Committee. doesn't guarantee that they can get their members to go along with them and vote for it, uh, but it's, it's definitely a sine qua non for, uh, for our background actually coming to pass. Uh, there was a vote on, on the House side, uh, I don't think it was a terribly perfect predictor as a vote of where the votes actually are in the House, uh, but there was an amendment to the House version of the Defense Authorization Bill on a McClintock amendment uh, that was to strike a section in the bill that has been there for a number of years that says nothing in this bill shall be interpreted to authorize a BRAC. Uh, that was really, uh, I guess, protective language uh, because there is other language in the bill because there have been prior BRAC rounds, some of which are still being executed. Uh, that, that talks about, you know, authorizing BRAC activities. And they just wanted to make it really clear, hey, that's the old BRAC rounds. There's nothing in here to do a new BRAC round. As Lucian, I think, very clearly illustrated, um, BRAC legislation is over, you know, it's 200 pages long. And so I think it's a bit of a stretch that anything in the bill would be interpreted to authorize a BRAC. But that language was there nonetheless. And, and I mention that only because I think the vo voting against that and striking that language may not mean that someone is irrevocably opposed to BRAC. Uh, I think it was relatively easy for a member to say, hey, this language is pretty harmless. Why do we need to strike it out? But the vote was 175 to 248. And it was pretty balanced uh, between Republican and Democrat. Uh, so there was support in both parties for striking that language and some, obviously some a significant amount of resistance to striking it. Uh, the one thing I would say as a longtime House staffer is uh, unlike in the Senate, where each vote is its own struggle to get one vote, uh, votes in the House tend to come in blocks. Uh, they don't come one by one. They come in tens and twenties uh, because like-minded members tend to vote together, uh, and you have regional groupings that vote together. Uh, and so generally, if you turn a vote in the House, you haven't turned one vote. You, you generally turn 10 to 15 votes, sometimes as many as 20 or 30, depending on the size of the block that you're working with. Uh, and so I would say that vote 175, you need 218, is only about two to two and a half blocks away from becoming a yes in the House. And that's really not that far uh, when you think about it, uh, if you can address some of the some of the current concerns that Congress has had. So uh, I, I think it's not necessarily that far away in the House uh, with the leadership and the Senate uh, coming along board. And, and I should say, historically, it has always been the Senate that has taken the lead on BRAC, has made it happen. Uh, and I don't see any reason to believe that's likely to change. Um, that there is real hope this year that, that they might be able to get there. Now, uh, the other point that I think is worth making is that the Hill did, uh, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, authorize the department to do the excess capacity analysis uh, that has now become one of the major uh, justifications or, or uh, bases for the request for BRAC, showing that there's 22 percent uh, excess infrastructure. Uh, so that also was a bit of a weakening uh, in the resistance in Congress to the idea of a BRAC. One in interesting thing about that is that uh, of that 22 percent, almost none of it is Department of Navy. Uh, the Navy really uh, essentially took a knee on BRAC, said, we think we've probably done enough. Uh, and uh, notwithstanding that there were some recommendations in prior rounds that, that, that never were executed or that were turned down by the commission, uh, 
where you might have thought the Navy would think to go again, but um, uh, the Navy is very good at detecting clear messages, and I think they, <laughs> they, they saw that uh, handwriting on the wall. Uh, so really the excess capacity is, is in the Army and the Air Force. Now, I don't, I'm not sure what political dynamic that has. It may free members who represent naval installations to feel more favorable to BRAC. Uh, it may make them um, – it's hard to know the political dynamics of that. Uh, it may make it less compelling because there's less opportunity to gain. There's not going to be as many Navy winners as there have been in the past. Um, so it, it, I'm not sure the political dynamic of that, but I suspect it's significant that the Navy didn't really identify any excess capacity. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, BRAC was really the cure for this overriding concern about politicization. Uh, and really the the... To some extent, the cure was perceived to have become the disease. Uh, people felt like the BRAC process itself had become problematic. And so uh, both in Senator, uh, Congressman Smith's version of the bill that he has introduced and has done for several years, uh, and now in the draft that Senator, uh, Senators McCain and Reid have released uh, for discussion, they've tried to address this idea that you know we, the cure needs to be the cure again and not the disease. Uh, and so... Fundamental questions that the Hill is likely to work on is this question of uh, there needs to be an independent arbiter in this process to make sure that politicization hasn't crept in. Uh, should that be another BRAC commission, as it has been for the previous five rounds, or should it be some other process? And the Senate has proposed essentially using GAO as an arbiter uh, to validate the analysis uh, and then letting Congress itself uh, make the final call about whether they think the round is, is, is correct or not. Uh, one of the issues about that, as I mentioned earlier, previously uh, they've always had the initial vote when there were no winners and losers, and then it was just essentially defending that position later on. Uh, and the, the Senate's formulation, uh, essentially, you would know who the winners and losers were when Congress is being asked to vote for it. Now, as I mentioned, there's a relatively small number of losers, and so that could certainly work. Um, but in the past, people's, the theory has been when you know whose bases you're targeting with your vote, and that may be your friend, that may be your colleague, someone who's an ally for you on other issues. Uh, it makes it harder, uh, even for those who, are, who aren't affected by BRAC to vote for it. So that'll be an interesting dynamic to see. And I'll, I'll stop there and let us move on to the question portion. Thanks, Andrew. Um, one of the things that Andrew brought up that I think is especially interesting that Lucian can address it is the capacity analysis done in March of 2016. It's a, a document that has served as the crux of all the arguments on quantifying the excess capacity. Uh, Secretary Niemeyer, would you mind talking about what does the document say and what does it does what does it not say and what are the limitations? Well, there's a, there's been a concern and questions by Congress for many years. Okay, what what are you really using as the analysis to justify your request for an authorization? And and when I was on the committee uh, staff working for Senator Warner, Senator McCain, we asked kind of the same questions, and and, and the concern was. At a time where we're looking at a growing um, rift or a growing, uh, a, a growing uh, a distinction or, or difference between the threats we face as a nation, the strategy we've developed to address those threats, and then the forces we are providing on behalf of our nation to uh, meet that strategy, um, there's a concern there that we were kind of not necessarily taking into account when the full range of threats or, or really using a BRAC request as an underpinning of a strategy. So for a few years there, Congress asked for, hey, can you provide us a little more justification on why you think you, uh, you, you, you have excess capacity? And it really is difficult for the department to do that without actually conducting the, the, the BRAC round. So what Congress has been asking us, hey, give us the analysis without actually, before we give you the authorization. And the response from Congress, is, uh, from, the, from the Department of Defense, we really need the authorization in order to be able to do the analysis. And we have an off-ramp. I mean, people don't realize the law does provide that um, if the Secretary of Defense, after the first year of analysis, looking at the force structure, looking at the defense strategy, looking at what we have for threats around the world, decides that, you know what, I've done the analysis, I really don't believe it's worth the expense or we're going to find the savings or well, we need to continue, then he certifies to Congress and uh, he, he does not believe a BRAC should go forward, and it stops. I think folks have forgotten that. That has always been in the law and it still exists in the, in the, in the proposal. So what, what Congress was trying to do is get a better understanding for where the department feels it's at. And it's really difficult for the department to be able to do that detailed analysis 
without causing concern, without creating you know, hysteria out there as far as what they're actually looking at as far as bases. There has been done no analysis until we get an authorization. There will be no analysis accomplished until we do an author until we get an authorization. Um, the idea, the notion that there's a list of base closures running around the Department of Defense is absolutely false. Still, Congress persisted uh, with the legislative request in the, in the 2015 Defense Authorization Act to try to give us something. So the department undertook a process trying to grapple with, okay, how do we do this without necessarily starting a BRAC analysis? They came up with a, an idea to take a look at the ratio of forces existing in, was it 1989 or 88? Look at the ratio of forces to infrastructure we had then, and then go ahead and apply that forward to current, current force structure. The original analysis was done looking at what then the Department of Defense in 2016 felt like the infrastructure would be in 2019, although the Congress actually asked for it to be applied to a force structure that existed in FY12. The department sent over the first report to Congress in April of 2016 that showed 22 percent excess capacity across all DOD um, based on that ratio of analysis. So looking at it objectively, and I think this is ultimately what Secretary Mattis did, is you know, I'm looking at, okay, 1988, was that really the right ratio of forces infrastructure? And then has that now become the re how we apply this forward? I think that's some of the concerns that he raised in her testimony earlier this year about that capacity analysis and whether we really do have 22 percent, 25 percent, 28 percent in the Air Force. I know there's some concerns that still exist about that. Still, we try to do the best we could, the department tried to do the best we could with the authorities we had and, 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 the, and to come up with what we felt was the best guess. And, and, and that's ultimately what you saw delivered to Congress. Um, first in, in, in April 2016, now Congress is asking us to update that report and to accurately reflect what they originally asked for, which is an FY12. We're in the process of working that package back to Congress. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that gets brought up multiple times is the 2005 round was uniquely transformational, that there was that emphasis on jointness. Um, and one question that I personally have is that if BRAC is the adequate venue to do this transformation. And I think that Secretary Principi would be able to comment on it if that is the, the appropriate venue to do those transformations and to emphasize jointness. And a, a lot of the, the answer to that starts with what other instruments does DOD have? Would, would you mind commenting on that, Secretary Principi? Sure. Um, Transformation is not synonymous with, with jointness. Transformation is not synonymous with co-location. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the 2005 round, um, many of the recommendations we received were within each service. There wasn't that much cross-service integration, if you will. There was some, uh, but, but clearly that wasn't overriding. Um, so I, th I think it is an opportunity for the Secretary of Defense uh, to... Uh, Move move that ball down the field with, with in terms of true transformation of our of our armed forces to get really more operational effectiveness in in, in joint war fighting training and readiness. Um, but clearly, the cost savings has to be uh, an important factor. And whether whether uh, that is raised to be one of the military value criteria is is really up to the Congress. Um, it is it is not a military value criteria. It wasn't in two thousand and five. Um, Important, yes, but again, as I as I indicated, it was a clear charge to the commission that that the secretary Secretary Rumsfeld was really more concerned about about this transformation of our military and and how it was structured and and going forward, I think it's going to be an important factor, uh, but I I also think that cost cost savings is going to be equally important, if not more important. Can I comment on that? Sure. So I've been wrestling with the term transformation too. I think that that was really a product of, of where uh, the, pre, um, the Bush administration was trying to get with the round. Um, it's also is a great way to separate where the previous administration, Obama administration, wanted to go with the round, which is they want to be efficiency-based versus transformational-based. I'm not sure how you can do one without the other. I think every BRAC opportunity offers, a, a, a BRAC authorization offers the opportunity to, to look at better ways to do things. If you call that transformational, I mean, so, so be it. Um, what I really and much more concerned about is how do we in, in, in enhance lethality and enhance readiness. I mean, we ultimately have the stationing of forces right now in the United States that may not be ideally placed in order to be able to get 
to the readiness they need every day. It's, it's, it's really difficult to have to send uh, our military forces somewhere else in the United States to train um, when they're already deployed you know, for, uh, for, for one year out of every two or three years. Um, so we need to look at how do we ultimately station those forces at locations that they can do more effective, more efficient, and are, and are, and a wider array of full spectrum training um, close to where they actually live and where their families are. Those, are, if you call that transformational, okay, fine, and okay, then, then you know we'll have a bit of transformation. I look at that as just increasing readiness, increasing lethality. Where we position weapon systems to have best access to the most the ideal ranges for that weapon system. I'm not sure that's transformational. That I call that just being able to make sure that our weapons isn't ready to go and when the balloon goes up. So I would, I would say point that more towards lethality. So as opposed to putting a label on what this round's going to be, what that round's going to be, I think really what we're looking at is a, as a round that will allow us to take a national defense strategy, look at how that informs military value. Because coming out of our national defense strategy, we'll have a clear indication of what the military value needs to be for installations and applying that military value to the stationing of forces. Um, uh, I think really to me that that is what we should be focusing on. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Let me just ahead. jump in on that. I, I think this is a really a key, maybe the key point, because uh, I, I was always a little concerned with the Obama administration saying it's all about saving, saving, savings, because you know the nature of the legal restrictions on moving people and on moving uh, and on closing facilities mean that it is the department is very sclerotic. It is very limited in what it's able to do aside from outright closures uh, or reductions in force uh, in terms of optimizing uh, its, its use of its assets, its base infrastructure. And so the department is not typically thought of bases as assets. Uh, in a lot of cases, it just boils down to cost. Uh, and so this idea of whether a next BRAC would be to optimize our strategic posture or just a savings drill uh, is those are two essentially fundamentally different exercises. Not unrelated. Not they unrelated, are, but, but uh, I'm a military guy and I'm responding to my Secretary of Defense that says we're going to save money in the next BRAC round. And by golly, we're going to save money too. And you can so save a... money. Uh, and like I said, optimizing, you know, there's a cost savings, uh, certainly opportunity there uh, to be had. But it, it's a very different going in point to say this is for strategic. Uh, posturing versus saying, uh, you know, we've had a budget cut and so we're going to go find some savings. One of the questions that I wanted to pose you, Andrew Hunter, is on the resistance that, that Congress has been showing to authorizing a new route. You start talking about four different things, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, costs, economic impacts, uh, the political process involved it, and how that becomes about politics and the capacity that they hope. How much of those concerns are real concerns that need to be addressed through changes in the BRAC process, and how much are those simply excuses to avoid a painful process? Well, I think they're all, they're all uh, real at some level. Uh, I would say none of them is illegitimate as a concern at all. Um, I would say of all of them, the upfront cost one, it, it's, it is factually true that there's an upfront cost. Um, it is also, I think, in some ways the weakest reason to oppose BRAC because, you know, if, if your answer is, well, I can't vote for BRAC because there's enough cost, then you're, you're just, you're ungettable. Your vote is unobtainable. That's a, because there's always an upfront cost involved. Uh, if that's your objection, then there's, there's no way to get to yes. So um, it, it's the most problematic of the reasons for me for that reason. Uh, there are economic implications. You know, uh, Lucian has pointed out very correctly that uh, the best way to address those is through a BRAC. Uh, the BRAC authority actually gives you the ability to work with communities and to reduce, minimize, or even ultimately reverse that job loss by utilizing that, that land base, that facility, uh, through some other means. Uh, I, I get the, the wonderful opportunity every year to go out to Monterey, the Naval Postgraduate School, for some work that we do there. And you know, going past Fort Ord and seeing the development that has happened up and around. It's taken some time, uh, but it's been a real uh, success story. That would not have been possible if we hadn't had BRAC authority, if it had just been a decision by the department to close uh, without any assistance to the community. So uh, so that's, you know, that, that job economic piece, to me, actually, you can turn that around and get people on board with BRAC uh, because they stand to gain from uh, having that authority. Uh, the politicization piece uh, you know, that's kind of, if you will, where BRAC started, was trying to address politicization. 
it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder, uh, to my view. I'm not sure I'm persuaded that there was politicization in the 2005 round, but I know there are some who feel that that is the case. Uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of outrage uh, in 1997 when the Clinton administration said that we were going to uh, they were going to privatize in place some of the facilities that had been on the on the background. I think actually history has somewhat borne out that decision because uh, there's still there's still work going on in San Antonio uh, that suggests that the economic rationale for staying there uh, may have made sense. But uh, you know, I think that's that's really the tricky one. How do you deal with that? How do people feel comfortable that that aspect of politicization has been addressed? I think it's very doable. It's just a matter of what, what get, how do you get the number of votes you need uh, to make people feel that they can support that new process. Mm -hmm. let, let me follow up on that a little bit because um, for, for a few years, few years there, I actually was part of the resistance in Congress. <laughs> so I'll throw us around another break. There's a couple of things here that you, uh, you also we, – we were paying attention to very much in the Senate Armistice Committee when the department was coming over the BRAC request. First of all, there was a there was a definite undercurrent to, hey, look, we're cutting forces, therefore we have excess infrastructure, therefore we need to cut infrastructure. Not everybody in the committee felt like cutting forces was the right thing to do. More importantly, a lot of folks felt like cutting forces was a result of budgets and not necessarily military strategy. A lot of folks in our committee felt that our military strategy was nowhere connected to where our threats were as, as a nation. So there was there was a feeling that if we weren't going to – if we felt like we were heading in the wrong direction with force structure reductions – there's no way that we would allow the, the department to permanentize them by reducing infrastructure. So it definitely had to be, there definitely was a concern of strategy, resources, and, and, and threats mismatch that, uh, that, uh, that kind of fueled some of the initial reaction uh, to authorizing a BRAC. There also was a concern that we needed to change the law and update it because there's no way anyone, to include Senator McCain, was going to allow a process to proceed that resulted in a $14 billion cost overrun in 2005. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but bottom line, that's an aircraft carrier right there. Um, and, there's, and, and so my charge was if we're going to even look at an authorization for another round, we have to update the law, not change it fundamentally, but update it in order to be able to put more cost controls, greater transparency, and a little bit more accountability into the process. Uh, and so that and, and that never came over from the Department of Defense. So that really was a huge sticking point that we asked for improvements to the actual law, and those were not provided. Now, you do have Congressman Smith's version of the BRAC authorization that does contain some of those cost controls. Um, still working with uh, with my colleagues in the department to what degree those can be carried out. Um, and that's and that's something we'll need to take a look at uh, moving forward to see what actually gets authorized. Uh, but those those major concerns really kept us from even entertaining the, the idea, and it really is something that we need to look at. The law does need to be updated um, to to allow for a more effective round, a more efficient round, uh, without seeing the uh, you know seeing the cost balloon up. I, I would I would add that uh, I think we need to keep in mind that many of the cost associated with my BRAC round in 2005, came after implementation. Uh, just one example, uh, the National uh, Geo Geospatial Agency facility was budgeted at $1.1 billion. The final cost of that was $2.5 billion. And, and you can go to Mark Center, you can go to the vast amount of, of, of construction, major military construction that took place after 2005. is just astronomical. You know, you might even say a little gold plating went into it, uh, but but clearly, you know, I, I think I think I think the commission implemented the law uh, as as it was drafted. I mean, we approved eighty six percent of of the recommended closures and realignments. That's that's the historical average. Uh, uh, we did we did disapprove a number of major of uh, major uh, closures. Uh, Groton Submarine Base, which we learned was a center of excellence in, in, in submarine warfare. Portsmouth uh, Naval Shipyard, we learned, was the most cost-effective, productive shipyard in the Navy. They could turn around a nuclear sub. They could refurbish and refuel a nuclear sub faster than any shipyard in the Navy. The data that went into the Pentagon to justify that that was used by the, by the Pentagon to close Portsmouth was not the data we received. It was different. So I think that was that's one advantage of the commission itself. Uh, that's not to say you cannot have a BRAC without a commission. You certainly can. Uh, but we also work hand-in-glove with GAO. 
and, and they were detailed. We met with them. I met with the Comptroller General several times to talk about the recommended closures and realignment. So I, I, th I think some of these costs came, came upon, came, came out after, after the implementation in 2005. Hey, one last thing, Fred, on, on, on congressional resistance. Uh, for my time on the committee, in the entire 11 years, I pretty much met with every defense community in the country. And, and since then, and when I, since I left the committee in 2014, the last three years, I've talked about just about every state uh, in the country. And, and I'm, I'm not so sure that there's not a growing uh, realization that a BRAC provides more opportunities for bases than it does threats. I think if you go around the country right now and talk to defense communities, you see the majority of them. I won't say the overwhelming majority, but there's more and more communities and states willing to sign up and tell the delegations, yes, we want a BRAC, because you've got bases with high military value that are only 60 or 70 percent utilized. They realize that, hey, they're ultimately going to get potentially stronger as, as a, from a BRAC round. So I think you're starting to see a growing swell of support for what BRAC can do for an opportunity for those bases they feel that they have a, a significant contribution to national security. And that really is ultimately what it should be about. I mean, we're, we're looking at those, you know, the, the country should embrace a process that allows us to put our forces at locations that ultimately will provide the most benefit, the most, the most effective um, uh, force uh, uh, available at the most efficient cost. And so I, 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 would, I have a feeling that that congressional resistance um, if these if senators and congressmen talk to their defense communities over the next few weeks to try to figure out we're going to vote on BRAC, I'm hoping that uh, senators take the opportunity to talk to their defense leaders, to, uh, communities, to talk to their uh, adjutant generals. I mean, the, the National Guard, uh, those uh, adjutant generals who took advantage of the BRAC process in 2005 got really well really fast because they were able to close readiness centers that were underperforming in poor demographic areas move over to, you know, to emerging demographic areas, they were able to, to make themselves much stronger come out of the background. So as folks are, are listening to their tags, their defense communities, their states, I think you're starting to see folks say, yep, BRAC is the right time. We, we've been working for 10 years on improving our military value. We think we have a better product to provide to the Department of Defense. Therefore, bring it on. We're, we're ready for it. Uh, just very briefly, uh, you know, Lucian's point about the department not modifying their proposal. Uh, I guess my view is this is, again, why having a champion is so important, because really the department is not optimized to carefully craft a revised legislative uh, proposal for this. I think the senator is. Uh, you know, that's his skill set. And I think having a champion to actually do that work of improving the, the legislation, that's the key difference. Thank you. I wanted to ask one last question to the panel before we open up for questions from the audience. Is there a better way to close facilities other than BRAC? <laughs> uh, you know, I, Secretary of Defense. And, uh, <laughs> so I know, learned I, in my I, three I, weeks I, of the job, I take uh, the hard questions, I pass them over to the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you would hope in an ideal world our Again, our military leaders, both civilian and uniformed, um, can make those those decisions with with congressional oversight. Um, this comes come up with some kind of format where you determine if there was some significant deviation from military value criteria, without the need for a, a BRAC commission. Um, but clearly, it starts. It's, I think it starts with, starts with the Secretary of Defense. I mean, he's the one who's charged with our national security, uh, and I think perhaps increased increased authority, if you will. And again, you keep, there's no limitations on the number of military personnel that can be moved. Yeah, there are limitations in law with regard to civilian personnel, uh, but you know, you can move combat brigades, you can move air wings, you can do all of that, and it, it's happening. And it's the people that bring community to communities to life. Not the buildings, not empty buildings, not with chain link fence, fence around some army installations, at least portions of army installations. That doesn't serve the community very well. Um, so I, I, you know, I think the role of the Secretary of Defense is fundamental and very, very important in 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 the decisions to close and realign military bases. I guess in my ideal world. Uh the law would be less rigid, and the department would have more flexibility to move folks, including civilian personnel, because it's hard to move large numbers of military without also affecting 
a relatively significant number of civilian folks, uh, they would have more flexibility to optimize infrastructure to strategy, infrastructure to force structure uh, over time. And, you know, I think it would be reasonable for Congress to say, hey, if you're going to go all the way to the point of closure of a major installation, check with us first. Are there be some safeguards around that? But I, I do feel like the statute could be opened up, and it's been narrowed successively over succeeding years, saying, you know, reducing the size of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of actions that you can take without uh, congressional approval. Uh, they could open that back up, and you might not need a full background uh, again for a very long time. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's been a while since the last one. I would say we've needed it, though. Uh, for much of that time that we haven't had it. And I think you could make it unnecessary to have BRAC authority uh, over longer periods of time if the law gave the department more flexibility to optimize it. Excellent point. I mean, I think ideally you, you want to go back to what, what our founding fathers intended, and that is the commander in chief has, should have the ability to close or open bases as, as he or she de determines to be in the best interest of national defense. I mean, I would love to go back to those days. Um, and, and, and just have Congress at least be advised and maybe some type of consent. I think the way you look at it, that's ultimately what the current amendment proposed by Senator McCain tries to get back to to some extent. Um, now we'll see to what degree politics plays in that process. And unfortunately, that's what has happened in the last 20 years is when the Secretary of Defense has looked at a base closure, that it does uh, ultimately involve jobs and, and, and politics. Um, but yes, if I, if I had my uh, if I had an opportunity to do it again all over again, I would just like to go back to the discretion of the Secretary of Defense advising the President of the United States that, hey, look, we probably don't need this base anymore. It's time to close in and save those dollars. You know, one aspect of the, uh, of the McCain-Reed Amendment dealing with uh, the vote, uh, as, as Lucian indicated, you know, or, or Andrew, in, in 2005, it, it, it took a vote of disapproval. Uh, now it's, according to the amendment, if I'm correct, it requires an approval, a vote of approval. And uh, is that going to inject more politics in it? Is that going to, is that going to stop can any senator uh, uh, put a hold on 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 the on the provision of law that that establishes a BRAC? So I, I that that one aspect concerned me how that would play out. Not to mention that the Senate has a very empty calendar that they have nothing else to consider. Uh, with that, we're going to open up for questions from the audience. Please ask your question in the form of a question. I believe we have a microphone. And uh, please identify yourself. If you want to direct a question to anyone, also say so. Uh, Andrew. Hi, Roxana Tyrone with Bloomberg. Um, do you think BRAC is uh, going to become the sticking point for national defense authorization in the Senate and going forward to conference if the Senate is successful in passing the McCain Amendment? Do you think it's going to be the sticking point? I, I'll take a first crack at it. My, I, I guess my quick answer would be no. Uh, it's certainly true that historically it has played that role in the past. Uh, former Chairman Bob Stump uh, at one point got up and was ready to, to bail out uh, on the NDA altogether as a result of BRAC, and Senator Warner got him back to the table, and ultimately they reached an agreement. But they came close. They came close to failure. It is not my sense that Chairman Thornberry is that opposed to BRAC, that he would literally walk away from the NDA. Now, I could be wrong, and I haven't – I don't have deep insight. I haven't had a personal conversation with either him or his staff director on this point. But I don't sense that his level of resistance is at that, uh, if you will, Bob Stump threshold uh, of, of opposition. So I wouldn't see this being a bill killer. Well, I mean, the, the way they've – structured it, and of course that was a, a decision by Senator McCain and Reed to hold uh, the proposal back, not put it in the committee bill, and have it on the floor. Uh, not to get us uh, derailed, but there was another very controversial provision uh, uh, on Don't Ask, Don't Tell where they went a different route and they put it in the bill and committee and then uh, it almost killed the bill because they, they couldn't get to the floor. But structuring it the way they have, Look, it'll either pass or fail as an amendment. If it's got the votes to go in as an amendment, then it can't be a bill killer because it's got substantial support. So the way they've structured this, I don't see it being a huge barrier in the Senate. Next question. There were a lot of that hands before. Thank you. My question is for uh, Secretary Niemeyer. Y you mentioned uh, that one of the improvements that's needed to the current BRAC law is the guarantee that there are certain cost controls uh, that are, are put in there, especially after the 2005 round. 
Uh, I'm curious if you can just comment on the McCain Breed Amendment as we were discussing and whether or not that contains some of those provisions that you're looking for. It does. It provides an overall cost of implementation of, I think, $5 billion, if I'm correct. Um, so um, it, it, that is a, a good first step. <clears throat> I'm not so sure now that I'm on the department side that I would want to be capped by that. <laughs> I was kind of hoping they would trust me as far as keeping the cost down. Um, but um, and there's also uh, um, in, in the Smith version, there's also a the requirement for the department to, to develop more detailed estimates beyond that of COBRA. I think there was an understanding that COBRA as a parametric modeling for doing scenario assessment was a very useful tool to be able to set aside certain scenarios and, and, and further pursue others. But at some point, you've got to move beyond COBRA and maybe do a little bit more engineering analysis of what a recommendation would cost. Um, the Smith Amendment does provide for some of those uh, requirements uh, through the form of plans to be submitted along with the recommendation. Um, not sure of, to what degree the department can implement that. That's something that we would need to, to take a look at. But uh, it really was at, – at those are the types of things is, is trying to get uh, Congress to be able to put some type of, of control. The 2005 round, unfortunately, Congress had very minimal authorization or ability to – um, do anything about the explosive growth of the BRAC request. And that's something that, that, that House and Senate are both wrestling with with different solutions. Thank you. Uh, Sandra Irwin with Net Real Clear Defense. Um, I wanted to ask um, Secretary Niemeyer about the, this whole idea that you want to optimize readiness and uh, make that a big part of the analysis. Can you say um, who's, who's involved in doing the analysis right now? Where does that stand? Um, and when do you expect to have some actual recommendations on that? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we are not doing any analysis on optimizing readiness for, as far as installation. So we're not doing a BRAC analysis. Obviously, we're looking every day um, at how best to utilize our ranges. And we're also looking at to what degree our current ranges can support fifth-generation weapon systems. Those discussions are happening every day in, in, in the military. To what degree we can support the president's energy policy by adjustments in range policies or, or access to ranges. Um, so, so there is a lot of discussion, of, um, and the secretary has charged each of us to, to immediately address the readiness concerns that, that exist not just in, in, in infrastructure but also in training and manning, things like that. So there's a lot of analysis going on there. Now, how it would apply to a background, that connection has not been made because we don't have an authorization for a background yet. I think uh, that would be one of the first things we'd want to do is look to see how readiness and capabilities are addressed in the new national defense strategy and then take that national defense strategy and apply it to military value and then start looking, okay, then how does that drive changes in infrastructure and ranges? So we have not done any analysis right now looking at realignments or closures or anything to do with any type of system or base, um, we are strictly looking at what infrastructure and facilities we have now and how to best um, use what we have now and to uh, maximize readiness. Um, that's, that's a good question. It's, it, I think it's, on, it's definitely on top of my mind. Um, the, there is a lot of discussion going on right now with uh, within the, the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of Defense, and and uh, I'm not sure exactly when we're going to see that. Can I just, uh, I think this is an, one thing I wanted to throw on the table, I think gets at this readiness, and certainly the range issue, is the opportunity potentially in a, a new BRAC round to look at uh, the ability to do more public-private partnership and, you know, cut down some of the upfront investment required on the government's end by having uh, some private capital invested as well. And if you look at uh, if you look at the ranges, if you, training ranges, if you look at the DOD labs and you look at the T&E infrastructure, these are real national assets, and they have value beyond just the military mission. Uh, and so we have an opportunity there to leverage uh, and not just improve, uh, not just make a one-time improvement to readiness, but an ongoing uh, improvement by bringing in some, some private capital uh, that would get some access to these national assets uh, in return. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity there during, in this uh, round. And so I'm hoping the language is flexible enough to make those opportunities uh, viable. And one of my concerns about the approach of the last administration, which was all about saving, saving, savings, is you couldn't maybe do some of those more creative things. 
And I think it's also pre-BRAC. I mean, public public private partnerships is a great way to reduce operational costs, whether it's in services, uh, building uh, joint uh, co-gen plants that serve the grid in the community and serve the military base. There are lots of ways that the military can save money and partner with the community to advance uh, uh, some of those some of those services and, it, and, and better position uh, the installation to survive a background. One of the, the underrated elements that I think it's under discussed is how fragile a BRAC process is for the sheer amount of off-ramps that you have throughout the process. And I think it was Secretary Nehemiah that started talking about that the, after there is an actual study to assess the capacity and matching that to the, the force structure. Uh, if Congress thinks that that's inadequate, it can just stop the process there. Uh, Clay, slight, slight clarification. Yeah, the Secretary please. of Defense can stop the process. Mm -hmm. once, once a BRAC is author, authorized, then um, yes, Congress can unauthorize a BRAC process. But the off-ramp I was talking about was – um, once a background is authorized, the Secretary of Defense has the, still the, the ability, has the prerogative to say, okay, now that I've done the in-depth analysis that you wanted me to do, and I just don't, I don't see the reason why we need to go for it. Yep. But in, in the same token, what almost happened in 2005 was that the commissioners were not confirmed, and if the commissions were not confirmed, you, you would stop the authorization of the background as well. Like th those type of off-ramps that, that I was referring that littered the, the legislation. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? I have a question about the um, the, the costs of the BRAC. I, there, there has been a criticism that the, the cost has escalated um, and beyond what the estimates of the department were. In the previous BRAC rounds, in the previous five BRAC rounds, environmental remediation was not considered one of the costs. Uh, there seems to be an indication or an effort, certainly in Senator McCain's amendment and in, in some of the House language, that environmental remediation would be included as a cost. Uh, in, in the past, this has had, you know, essentially two implications. The environmental costs have just skyrocketed. They're unknowable, as, the, as, 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 as Secretary Principia said. You know, it, it's one of those costs that has gone up. And you'd never know that until you open up the ground. Now, environmental costs were not included in the previous rounds because it was considered a governmental responsibility. Government's got to clean it up whether the base is open or closed, so it's not a unique cost to BRAC. Um, and secondly, if you include it, then there's a tremendous bias to only close clean bases. Because you put one shipyard on the list, like Mare Island Shipyard or Hunter's Point, you've blown your $5 billion cap right there. So should environmental remediation costs be included in the process? Well, uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me begin from 2005. And, and apart from the four military value criteria, you have the four economic criteria. You know, uh, one of those has to do with environmental remediation. But the remediation is not to future uses like redevelopment to a, a residential community. It's it's clean up to its current use, military use. Uh, so, but you're you're absolutely right. It's not for redevelopment. You're going to close a military base, and it's going to be redeveloped. Like we've talked about, there is life after BRAC in many many places. Uh, those costs have to be borne, if you will, by the by the community, or the developers that are going to come in and redevelop San Diego or redevelop Newport or redevelop whatever it might be. I take a little bit different perspective. From my understanding, the reason why the department in the past uh, set aside environmental costs because you do not know, you would have to you would have to anticipate what the proposed use might be. And now we get into a whole discussion with the community that you weren't prepared to enter into while you're doing negotiations. Also, I think that there really wasn't enough environmental data available in the previous rounds of BRAC. I think the Department of Defense has done a tremendous job over the last 10 years um, investigating what they have on their military bases. And I think what you really look at in the, in the proposed legislation is at least accounting for an environmental baseline study in the preliminary analysis and <clears throat> determine what you have and, and, and to make some rough order magnitude of what you might have to clean up those costs. But I agree, um, it would definitely uh, disadvantage 
uh, the sites that are clean and the bases that are clean, it would definitely advantage um, the sites that are have a lot of cleanup. Um, so I think the department still, we still have work to do on to what degree would incorporate that into the COBRA analysis or to what degree would incorporate that as a, as a final element in assessing the, 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 um, the recommendation. And now one last question. Are we almost done? Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, Travis Tritton with the Washington Examiner. Um, I, I think Chairman Thornberry has uh, talked a bit about the upfront costs which you suggested puts people in this unget ungettable vote category. So I, I'm wondering um, if you see his opposition as being a key, if not the key hurdle, and whether you think that there's any possibility of some type of a political compromise between Chairman Thornberry and, say, uh, Chairman McCain and the Democrats on the armed services. Yeah, I think there is room for, for a compromise. And, you know, I think, as Lucian has indicated, the idea of capping the upfront costs or at least uh, scaling it in some way that Congress can then control. So maybe they could set a cap, and if the department came back and made a really compelling case that actually if you gave us $18 billion of upfront cost, you know, we can spread it out and it's really going to pay off in the long run. We can do a lot more useful stuff, then Congress could obviously revisit that number uh, in a future round. But I think the idea of setting some kind of a, an ability for Congress to and, um, have some measure of control over uh, how much they're putting in in terms of upfront cost and ongoing cost. Uh, I think that is the that is the basic grounds for a compromise on that issue. Uh, and you now it can be it could be very limiting depending on how it's written, uh, how hard of a cap it is made. But uh, but I think it is the ground for a reasonable compromise between the two sides on that issue. Uh, I didn't mean to imply that I think uh, Chairman Thornberry is an unguttable vote, although ultimately he may never want to vote for this, but there's a big difference between not voting for something and saying I'm willing to torpedo the whole bill over it. Uh, so I don't think that the threshold is not to turn Chairman Thornberry into an enthusiastic BRAC supporter. Uh, it's just to uh, making it something that he can live with. Also, as a veteran of uh, 11 de National Defense Authorization Conferences, he, uh, there's also uh, the ability for him to give up on one thing in order to get something else. I'm not sure there's ever a conference where um, members of the big four, who are the ranking members and chairman of each of the committees, don't come away having had to take on an unsavory provision that they didn't particularly agree with, um, and either because they had to do it for the sake of the bill or they were able to get something else in return on a compromise. With that... Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys coming over and, and speaking to us about BRAC. Uh, I think we have sandwiches outside. Or no? I don't. Sorry. <laughs> Either way, thank you so much for coming over. And uh, please join me in a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much.